Welcome back to OZK 150. We're going to be finishing our section on early Anglo-American settlement, and we'll get into some German settlement beginning in the 1830s. Before we do that, we'll have our famous Ozarker of the day. All right. Okay, you got the profession. Is he the one from um, Marshfield? No, he's not from Marshfield. Not from Marshfield. They were trying to read the name on the Anger name. <laughs> yeah, he's either an astronaut or he's uh, he's a giant holding an actual you know <laughs> space shuttle. But we'll just go with the astronaut on this. Uh, that's who it is. It's Tom Akers. Does anybody know where Tom Akers is from? Oh, Yeah, yeah, Akers Ferry. You've been over to Akers Ferry. And uh, Tom Akers from West Eminence, Missouri, a real-life astronaut. I think he made uh, four space shuttle missions uh, in the 1990s, and uh, he's a graduate of what's now MST in Rolla, and uh, actually retired uh, from teaching there just, uh, just a couple of years ago. I think he was a math professor there after he retired from the Air Force. Uh, but he was, uh, had started his career as a high school teacher uh, in uh, West Eminence and decided to, you know, like a lot of people teaching high school, decided to go be an astronaut. How can you be a West Eminence? It's hardly an Eminence. <laughs> right. Well, the reason there's a West Eminence, uh, West Eminence was an old, uh, it was an old timber town. Uh, Eminence is the old, it's the county seat of Shannon County. And back in the timber boom days of the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, there, was a, there was basically a company town that was established just west of Eminence, and it became West Eminence. It, was, uh, it had a different uh, reason for being there, and because it was a company town, it was, it was considered separate from old Eminence. And that's where, that's where he was from, West Eminence. So, Tom Akers. All right. Our phrase for the day, right smart. Two words we all know. Maybe we don't know them when you squeeze them together. Like that. What, is it, what does right smart mean to, a, to an old-timey Ozarker? It really doesn't mean anything common sense would tell you it means. No, uh, like, like it smarts. Yeah, that's, no, it's not, nothing to do with that. It usually refers uh, to distance or amount. And what it means is, yeah, it's, it, it's the same thing as a fur piece, or it can be a lot of something. Or it could be just, you know, a fur piece, a far, a far distance. Yeah, a fur piece is yeah, a long ways off. That's what a fur piece. Yeah, a fur piece is yeah. Yeah. Well, that that could be a fur piece too, but yeah, in in the early Ozarks, it could have been either one. You know, back back in the days of the beaver pelts and stuff like that. You know, so, but uh, but that's what it means. A right smart. Generally, I've heard it, uh, people I've, I've heard use right smart, generally are talking about a distance. You know, that, that town's a right smart off. You know, or I got, uh, I got my shot last week and it, it hurt a right smart. You know, it hurt a, hurt a lot, that kind of thing. And that's one you can, you'll still occasionally hear, my guess is, in Douglas County, Ozark County, you get you find the right old timer, and and you'll hear it. Yeah, you just haven't you just haven't talked to the right person yet. Or they see you and they think, you know, young generation, they won't have a, she won't have a clue what I'm talking about. So we'll just pocket that little phrase, and save it, you know, for bingo night or something. And, but yeah, you you'll still hear that one. I've got uh, there's a. Uh, uh, 
a man I know in, in my home community down in Arkansas who uh, uses it a lot. He's 90 years old, so that you know probably indicates uh, the generational change there. But but uh, almost every time I talk to him, he says, "Write smart," you know about something. So, all right. And it's Walmart's for a true Ozarker. You know, you don't you don't go to Walmart. It's Walmart's or at least Walmart's. There's always an S on the end of it. Yeah, now Washington's a little trickier because even St. Louis does Washington. Yeah, that's not just the Ozarks. That's that's. Uh, you are you St. Louis? Yeah, Washington. Yeah, or, or you know, Wash. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, if you ever listen to the Cardinals on the radio. Mike Shannon always says Washington. You know, he's from he's from St. Louis. So that's but you'll you'll hear that in the in the rural Ozarks too, but that's that extends even to some city folk who will say that. All right. So let's get back to our discussion of settlement in the Ozarks. When when last we left our Anglo American settlement, we had talked about Moses Austin and the settlement of Potosi, the Minor Britain area of of Washington County, and here is an artist's rendition of Potosi in 1818. We saw that Potosi was officially founded in 1813. Of course, the, uh, Moses Austin had had that settlement there even before that, but it became the seat of Washington County. And you can see quite a substantial little settlement, certainly by the standards of the interior Ozarks. Potosi is nowhere close to the Mississippi River, at least when you're thinking in terms of like St. Genevieve or Cape Girardeau, it's, it's well inland, uh, several dozen miles off of the river. It's one of the earliest of the inland interior Ozarks towns to be founded. And uh, Potosi is still a place today, even though it's a lot closer to St. Louis than we are, and it's, it's way over there, away from, uh, across the region, uh, away from us, it's still a place that I would consider an Ozark place today, culturally and historically. Uh, uh, alias uh, Mina Burton. And it's actually, in this case, it's spelled B-U-R-T-O-N. Uh, yeah, even, even though the, uh, the French spelling was usually B-R-E-T-O-N and is often pronounced Britain. Uh, in this case, it's, it's Burton. So, yeah. Yeah, the early settlers would have probably still referred to it as uh, Mina Burton or Mina Britain for years after it became Potosi. Some other early American settlement around the same time, the late 1700s. Uh, one of the uh, key settlements just south of Potosi was the Bellevue Valley. And it's a very beautiful place if, you, if you're over in that part of the state. Uh, that you get uh, Potosi's a little hilly, and then you drive not too far south, and you get out into this big valley area. And that was attractive to agricultural settlers from the earliest days. The Bellevue Valley became a very uh, prosperous farming area uh, for that part of the Ozarks. Another place that became a prosperous farming area was known as Murphy's Settlement for several years before it became known as Farmington, and it was settled by a family named, not surprisingly, Murphy in the late 1700s. The Bellevue Valley and Murphy's uh, were both primarily settled by people from Tennessee. In the Bellevue Valley, the chief town eventually became uh, Caledonia, or Caledonia. This was a place that was heavily influenced uh, by some Presbyterian settlers who had come in in the early 1800s, though there were lots of other, there were lots of non-Presbyterian settlers as well, but uh, Caledonia uh, being a, another name for Scotland, reflected the 
Presbyterian heritage of, of many of the people of that area. One of the scholars who has uh, written about that part of the Ozarks uh, calls Caledonia the best example of an American Protestant farm town of the early 1800s. It was one of the first towns in, in the interior Ozarks to be founded actually as a town because remember when we talked about those American settlements like the Bellevue Valley, like uh, Murphy's, generally the way they developed was by scattered farmsteads. A family would, would move on to a couple hundred acres and down the creek there would be another family, you know, a mile away or something like that. And there was very little town building by the Americans in those days. Caledonia was one of the exceptions to that. But you notice they only uh, started the town about 20 years after people had started settling in the Bellevue Valley. So generally their rule was either towns start as county seats when new counties are carved out of old counties and you have to have a seat somewhere and you get a town that grows up there or they're like this the settlement has grown big enough to all of a sudden uh, it's you have enough commerce to support a store or two maybe a, an attorney a doctor that kind of thing and so you get this organic growth of of towns like that it's a it's a, a pretty li little town in that same area uh, of the state. I don't remember what highway number that's on, but uh, is it 32? Yeah, Th yeah, that's the one that goes up through Potosi, isn't it? 32. That's the 32 goes through Salem. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Eight goes from Potosi to. Steelville, doesn't it? It's east west. Yeah, yeah, and it goes, it comes out on the on I forty four. Yeah, near there. All right, some early settlement. So far, we've we've mainly talked about Missouri, and I'm not trying to give short shrift to my home state, but uh, settlement in Arkansas happens a little bit later in the Arkansas Ozarks. If you remember our Ozarks map. Uh, the, the geographic Ozarks in Missouri goes all the way over basically to the Mississippi River in some parts, uh, but down in Arkansas, it kind of uh, cuts down through here and, and like that. So this part of Arkansas is flatland, delta, swampy country, and it's not part of the Ozarks. And so it was a little later uh, when people started settling in the Arkansas Ozarks. As we've seen in other cases, Early settlement often happens along uh, rivers and creeks where you have fertile land and land that's uh, maybe easier to get to. In these days, uh, rivers were arteries of transportation in ways that they aren't now. The Mississippi still can be, but uh, most people don't travel up and down White River. Part of the reason is we've got dams on it, and you're not going to, you're going to eventually run up against the dam and you can't go any farther. But in these days, rivers were uh, key ways to get from one place to another. They were key ways to transport goods, to market and to get things from New Orleans or St. Louis or wherever they're coming from. And so not surprisingly, some of these earliest settlements in the Arkansas Ozarks were along rivers. In this case, the Black River, which starts in southeast Missouri and then flows down into Northeast Arkansas, in uh, Randolph County, Arkansas, and uh, this county is on a White River. And we know that White River starts in Northwest Arkansas, flows up into Southwest Missouri, uh, Table Rock Dam, Table Rock Lake, that's White River down there. Uh, goes by Branson, and then back down into Arkansas. And a couple of the earliest settlements uh, there in, in Randolph County right after 1800. The earliest known settler settles here on White River in Arkansas around 1810. An interesting story that goes back to our Scots-Irish. The earliest known settler on, the low, on that part of White River in Arkansas was a man named John Lafferty and his family. And uh, 
Lafferty was born in, in Northern Ireland. He came with his family when he was a small child uh, to America. They came to first to Pennsylvania, like so many of the Scots-Irish did. They ended up eventually moving down to North Carolina. And from there, uh, the Lafferty's, or John Lafferty, made his way over into West Tennessee and became what was known as a long hunter. Does anybody know what a long hunter was? Daniel Boone was a, a long hunter. What does it stand for? Well, they did have, uh, you know, hugely long rifles. If you've ever seen some of those old pictures, those old muskets that they, they had. Oh, the long stood for uh, going out on very long hunts, being gone for long periods of time, maybe for a year or more. Uh, you know, this is, this is not, you know, going to the cabin for the weekend. When the long hunters went on hunts, they were, they were going for a long time. And Lafferty became one of these long hunters. He eventually uh, became a keelboat operator. Keelboats uh, were boats that were used to go upstream uh, back in the days before steam power. And they used long uh, poles. Uh, to, to, it was a very laborious process and a very hard process uh, that the crew members used to kind of pole their way up streams on these keel boats and they, they uh, took goods to people up rivers and then transported you know back down rivers and he was uh, traveled all over uh, the kind of south central part of the United States in the Louisiana Purchase and traveled into the Ozarks and in 1810 as he was getting older he decided to settle down and settled on the west bank of the White River in what's now Stone County Arkansas and eventually, his family, he died shortly after the War of 1812, but his family, who was still there, had to move back across onto the east side of the river in 1817. You remember from an earlier class why that would have been? There you go, that's good. The Cherokee Reservation in 1817 was given to uh, the Cherokees, and it was, on, it was on the west side of White River, his family lived just on the west side, and they, uh, like the few white families that had settled on that side of the river, uh, they were made to move back across the river to the other side. And uh, in, in my home county, which is right here, just across the river from Stone County, uh, there's, a, there's a Lafferty Creek there today that commemorates the area uh, where his wife, his widow, uh, moved back across the, the river because of the Cherokees. Another early White River settler in Arkansas was Jacob Wolf. Wolf was of German descent. This is the house that he built in the late 1820s. It is still standing. That's why it's a colored picture. He built that in the late 1820s. It overlooks, uh, just underneath this little hill here, is uh, White River. And just back over here a little ways is the North Fork of the White River. He built it at the confluence where the North Fork, if you've heard of North Fork Lake, uh, which is mainly in Arkansas but, all, but extends into southern Missouri, uh, where the North Fork River runs into White River, uh, Built, uh, built his house there. It was a trading post. It was used as a courthouse for a while uh, and uh, was a tavern. You know, all those things that these uh, important buildings important at, in important places were used for in the 1800s. But Wolf's family reflects that German heritage of some Ozarkers. His family had, uh, his ancestors had come over uh, in the 1750s from Germany, probably from R Rotterdam, but they were, they were Germans. And they had uh, come to Philadelphia. And after a few years living in Pennsylvania, the family had moved down into the Carolinas, settling in the North Carolina Piedmont. And it was there that Jacob Wolf was born in 1786. And his family, when he was a boy, in, in about 1799 sold their 
land in North Carolina and moved to Kentucky, to Western Kentucky. And after living in Western Kentucky for the better part of 20 years, they moved into the Ozarks, moved in to, uh, into the White River Valley in Arkansas. And Jacob Wolf, it is uh, believed, uh, the documentation, as you can imagine, is pretty scant from, from that period in history, uh, but there's a lot of reason to believe uh, that Jacob Wolf uh, was probably involved with the Delaware, uh, with the Shawnee Indian migration, uh, and uh, probably uh, may have been a blacksmith uh, for the Shawnee Indians. Remember when we talked about the Cherokees having that land on the west side of the White River, one of the groups that they invited to, to settle on that land were the Shawnees to serve as a buffer between the Cherokees and the Osages up in Missouri and Kansas. And so the Shawnees lived across the river, uh, the, the hill in this area you can see on this side would have been Shawnee land in the 1820s uh, before the Cherokees gave up their land and, and moved to Indian territory. And so he probably uh, traded with and, and served as a blacksmith for the for the Shawnees while he was there, and then had this had this trading post eventually on the this is on the east side of the river. But again, very similar story to say John Lafferty, the Scots Irish guy who ends up living just down the river from Jacob Wolf uh, before Jacob Wolf moves into the White River Valley, and the different strains, uh, ethnic uh, national strains that go into these early Ozarks people. So, you know, they, they came from a lot of different backgrounds. The, a lot of the early settlement into uh, this part of the Ozarks, into southwest Missouri, came up the White River Valley. You know, it's not too awful far uh, down the James to the White River from here. And that was one way that people got into southwest Missouri. They came up the White River uh, then up the James Fork, as it was known in those days, or the James River, and then they're basically here in the Springfield area if they come far enough up, up the James. And that was uh, the way that the earliest settlers in southwest Missouri got to southwest Missouri. And a lot of the early settlers in the Springfield area got here that way, coming up the White River instead of coming overland. Some of the early... Other early uh, important river towns in the Ozarks, uh, Greenville, which still exists, though it's not in the same place it used to be, uh, Greenville, Missouri, and Wayne County. It's still the seat of Wayne County. Uh, old Greenville uh, was moved to make new Greenville when uh, a lake was built over in that part of the state. Uh, but it was founded in 1819. And uh, you can see here uh, what now we call Warsaw, which was originally Bledsoe's Ferry, founded on the Osage. And it, for many years, was a very important river port on the Osage River. Uh, for, uh, for many years, it was the place that the steamboats came up to and didn't go any farther above. Uh, Bledsoe's Ferry, and so uh, it became what we call an entrepot, a place where trading comes to, and people from the interior bring their stuff there and pick up stuff at Bledsoe's Ferry and take it back home. It became a very important uh, river trading center. And there were lots of these uh, river towns around the region. That's just two of them that we mentioned. Again, river settlement being very important in those early days. In places where you had fertile creek and river bottoms, the, the fertile land in these creek, creek and river bottoms was almost always occupied before the ridge land, the higher country, uh, which wasn't as fertile, which didn't have water as accessible. Now some of the exceptions were in the Springfield Plain area, there's, uh, we know here there's, there's no major river that goes through Springfield. Again, as we talked about in an earlier lesson, we're on a kind of a high peak of ground here, uh, on a sort of watershed piece of ground here. 
where the water goes one way or another. We're on a very high ground for the Ozarks. But it's fertile ground out there. And there were lots of springs in those early days, even though a lot of them have gone dry over time. But the, the earliest settlers found lots of springs in the region. The earliest settlers in what would become Springfield included uh, John Polk Campbell, uh, the Fulbright family. There were several families who all got here around the same time, around 1829, 1830, right, after, right about the time that the Delaware were being moved out of the region and this area of Missouri was opening up for Anglo settlement. And this is a picture of Louisa Campbell, who was the widow of John Polk Campbell. I don't think there's, a, uh, there's a, an image of John Polk Campbell that has survived. Uh, but uh, the Campbells were early settlers here. Of course, we still commemorate the name around Springfield in, in a variety of ways. And uh, the Roundtree family, some of you know where the Roundtree neighborhood is and Roundtree School. Uh, they were one of the earliest families. Uh, a Roundtree was uh, the first person to establish a school in what would become Springfield. And this is just a little, gives us a little idea about how a person got to Springfield in those early days and the trouble that it was. Uh, one of the neat things that has survived is a, uh, the diary of Joseph Roundtree, who was the Roundtree who settled uh, here in Springfield. And in, uh, the Roundtrees uh, made their first came to the Springfield area in 1830 and came back and settled for good in 1831 and left a pretty detailed record of how they got here. The Roundtrees lived in Middle Tennessee, uh, south of Nashville in that area, and uh, came uh, all the way uh, by, by horseback, uh, all the way to uh, southwest Missouri, made at least two trips that we know of. The second one more in a wagon train because the families were coming and all that kind of stuff. But uh, Roundtree mentions... Uh, a lot of the places they went, how long it took them to get from one place to another. Uh, he talks about crossing the Ohio River, crossing southern Illinois, crossing the, uh, the Mississippi River at Cape Girardeau. And they basically came from Cape Girardeau, came up through Potosi, uh, through uh, basically kind of that route we were talking about, almost where Highway 8 is from there all the way to basically where I-44 would be today, uh, the St. James area. Uh, seems like they're sort of going out of the way, that doesn't it? But, right, right that, that, was the, that was the road. I mean, that's how, if you were traveling from, from that part of Missouri to southwest Missouri, that's how you went because you, uh, we know that the, the Cottaway Hills are in the way. If you just plowed you know, straight across southern Missouri, you're going to traverse some pretty rough terrain, and that was an easier route to take. You, you go up through more settled areas, you hit that high ridge where I-44 is today, and you sort of come down that ridge to Springfield. And when he came back, he came back the second time with his family in the winter time, and it took him uh, six days uh, they had to wait six days to cross the Mississippi River. As he mentioned, there, was, there were big chunks of ice floating in the river, and it was dangerous, and the river was up. And they had to wait six days on the Illinois side before a ferry could get them across to the Missouri side. And they had to make several trips because they had animals with them and wagons and, and all that kind of stuff. And it really, uh, the, uh, when, you, when you read the, about the trip from there to Springfield, it's sort of funny because, I mean, it wasn't funny to them. It took them a long time. It took them a couple weeks uh, to make this trip just from southeast Missouri to Springfield because stuff kept bro breaking. You know, wagon wheels would break or axles and stuff like that, and they'd have to fix something. And it was a, it was a, really, a really tough process uh, to make that trip in those days, 500 or so miles from middle Tennessee to, uh, to southwest Missouri. Uh, but it's a, uh, he was 
obviously happy with the area. He mentions in his uh, diary that when he first came out, he came with three young men. And the last thing they did before they went back uh, to get their families, the ones who were going to move to southwest Missouri permanently, was they built three log cabins. They had picked out land that they wanted to settle on. They didn't own it. They just thought, hey, nobody's living here. It looks pretty good to us. Let's, we'll, we'll mark our territory by building log cabins, which they did in just a few days. You know, a good, somebody good with an ax, a good, young, strong, you know, pioneer could throw up a, a log cabin in, in a couple of days, and that's what they did. The four of them working together, built these log cabins, went back to Tennessee, brought back their family. When they got back, they found a family had moved into one of the, the cabins that they had built, uh, but there was no shooting or, you know, anything like that. Uh, the, the family agreed uh, to leave when they found out the circumstances. You know, if you just walk up and there's a cabin unoccupied, you probably know somebody's going to come claim it at some point, uh, but it's good to be in the dry uh, as long as you can so you get in there. But it was, uh, that's the way it was. And the, the land office doesn't open up in Springfield until a few years later when they actually start selling uh, the land uh, to these places. And there, by then, there are dozens and dozens of families already settled here, uh, squatting on the land. Uh, eventually, the federal government passes what's called a preemption law, a uh, preemption act, which gives squatters the first opportunity to buy their land so that you couldn't have lived somewhere and grown a crop and built fences and stuff like that and somebody else come along and buy your land out from under you. You've got first dibs on on that land. And so a lot, of, a lot of people did that. They would settle on a place, make improvements, as the phrase was, and then they buy the land after a while. Uh, and that's, that's the way things worked in those days. But the round trees were early settlers and were fortunate to have at least some record of, of their experiences here. As we, as we talked about the fertile areas along the rivers and creeks were the first to be claimed all over the region. Of course, the farther you get inland, say like the 11 Point River, you know, the farther up the river you get, the later it's claimed because you're just a long ways from, from everything. But, but eventually those river and creek bottom lands were claimed. And by the 1840s and 1850s, as the region starts to fill up with people and families, you start to see more and more people buying land that's not very good land, buying ridgetop, hilltop land that's away from the rivers and the creeks that maybe doesn't have spring water on it, uh, some pretty rough territory. And part of that is spurred by a series of laws that Congress passes, which gradually reduce the price of land over time. Up until the 1840s and 1850s, most people couldn't afford to buy this land, but you can see by the time that the Graduation Act, as it was called, the Graduation Act of 1854 is passed, it reduces a lot of the available land to as little as 12 and a half cents an acre. So you could buy, you know, you can imagine how much land you could buy for 12 and a half cents an acre, even back in those days. You know, just about everybody could find some way to scrape up money and buy 80 acres uh, for 12 and a half cents an acre or 40, 40 acres. And uh, that, was, that was a pretty good deal. And that's when there's, a, there's an explosion of land buying in the Ozarks beginning in the, in the mid-1850s. Uh, when all of a sudden land is really, really affordable. Now, a lot of it's, it's still available. If you're buying it from Uncle Sam, from the federal government, but in the mid-1850s, that means it's been sitting on the market for decades and no one's ever bought it. So chances are it's not the greatest land in the world, or it's way out in the middle of the Ozarks somewhere, away from the nearest road or the nearest riverboat port or something like that. That's just the way that works. But there were many people who uh, got land during that period. 
One of those families, a couple of those families we'll talk about, uh, one family from Shannon County, the Buffingtons. I just like the name Buffington. I, you know, they're worth talking about just, just for that. But the Buffingtons came in the 1850s. You can see there they actually came from Illinois in 1854. I don't know if, if their arrival was, it was just coincidence that it was the year the Graduation Act was passed that really reduced the price of land or just, or they actually uh, were influenced by the Graduation Act. But they came uh, across the, uh, they crossed the Mississippi at Chester, Illinois, which is just downriver from Cape Girardeau, and made their way across the Cottaway Hills into Shannon County. Uh, they originally settled on Blair's Creek, and then eventually moved to Mahan's Creek, south of Eminence. And while they were building, the first year they were there, they lived in a tent. The family did. This was a large family, too. I guess they lived in tents, probably. But, uh, but we know from uh, the, the narrative left by one of the Buffingtons in the early 1900s, writing about his experiences coming to Missouri in 1854, we know that the family lived in, in a tent. They... Uh, built a log cabin the first year they were here. Uh, he mentions that they remember that they're coming uh, from Illinois and they, they had to travel as light as they possibly could. They had one ox cart that they brought over with their, what goods they had in it. And they left a lot of stuff back in Illinois where they came from. They had to make a plow stock, a homemade plow stock when they got here. That's the, the wooden base of the plow that you actually put the plow, uh, the actual plow shares onto. They, he mentions that they didn't have plow lines, the leather straps that you, that you have hooked up to a horse, or in this case probably an oxen, uh, to guide them while you're plowing, that they made their plow lines out of uh, hickory bark. I mean, these people were living, you know, they were making do with what little they had. He mentions in one case that he worked uh, about a month and a half building a rock fence. And if you go out in the rural Ozarks occasionally, you see these, these rock walls. Uh, and those served, per they served the purpose of a fence where you didn't have one before. And they also served the purpose of getting the rocks out of the field. You know, if you're going to uh, grow anything in the Ozarks, you're going to have to fight rocks. You're never going to get rid of all of them. But uh, that's one reason you have a lot of rock walls in places in the Ozarks. People have just piled them up to get them out of the field and made, made walls out of them. But he mentions building this rock fence for a neighbor farmer for a month and a half, and he was paid with a cow. So at the end of, at the end of his work, the guy gives him a cow, and hopefully it survived and uh, you know, had calves and you know, pays off in the, in the long run. But this was a, a quite a... Uh, a pioneer uh, area. I mean, this was a place that wasn't heavily settled. He mentions that on the creek they live on, that the nearest families are a couple miles away on either side. And this is one of those areas that was not heavily settled until uh, the 1850s when you start getting cheaper land and people start pushing into the farthest reaches of the interior of the Ozarks because this is rugged land over there in the, in the Cottaway Hills. Uh, but the Buffingtons were able to survive on it. And there are probably still Buffingtons over there today. I don't know, but uh, certainly descendants of this family over there today. Now, a different family, a different look at people coming into the region around this time were the Flanners, who made their way to uh, Dent County. And that's, if you know where Salem, Missouri is, that's Dent County, uh, in the late 1850s. Uh, the Flanners were very different from the Buffingtons. The Flanners, uh, the uh, Henry Flanner, the guy whose diary tells us about his experience coming to uh, that part of Missouri from Ohio, uh, was educated. He was actually coming to Missouri to start a school. He felt uh, that he was being led to, uh, to offer education to uh, the, the destitute and uneducated. And he thought for a while and said, well, the Ozarks sounds like a good place to go to find 
the destitute and uneducated. And, that, and that's one reason he wanted to, he wanted to come some, someplace that was far away from the railroad, far away from uh, the Mississippi River, uh, far away from what he considered civilization. And so he ended up in Dent County, Missouri. But he actually came uh, a different way than some of the other settlers we talked about. He started on a steamboat in Wheeling, West Virginia, on the Ohio River, came all the way down the Ohio, up the Mississippi to St. Louis, and it took him just seven days. Now today, we would think, oh, holy cow, seven days from Wheeling to St. Louis, you know, we could almost walk that, but, but that, was, uh, that was making pretty good time when you think just a few years earlier, uh, you would have been uh, traveling by foot or horseback uh, across there, but now with steamboat travel, seven-day trip at St. Louis, this is the late 1850s, uh, the railroad has been built at least a little ways west of St. Louis, and he gets on the uh, railroad at St. Louis and rides the rails uh, to Gray Summit, uh, which is still there today. Gray Summit is uh, right before you get to Six Flags. What's, what's the name of that Six Flags town? Yeah, it's, it's, what, 20 miles on this side of, if you're on the, if you're on I-44, uh, it's not too far on this side of uh, uh, Eureka. So you're getting in, into kind of the, the outer, outer edges of St. Louis when you get to Gray, but that's where the, the train stopped back in those days. So he had to get off the train at Gray Summit. He traveled by a stagecoach for about nine miles, and then he was on, and then that was it. After that, he was on foot. Uh, traveling into the interior of the Ozarks, and eventually, uh, eventually he does go part of that way by horseback. But he ends up at Lake Spring, which is uh, which is now a small community uh, northwest of of Salem. In yeah, you know, yeah, it's kind of halfway between Salem and Rolla, is where it is uh, today, and. He finds a place there, they buy land, he goes back to Ohio, gets his family, and they move out uh, to Dent County, Missouri. He starts a school there, and eventually, uh, according to the, the information I have on him, he eventually leaves Missouri at the beginning of the Civil War. He's kind of run out by uh, pro-Confederates. Uh, he was a, a pro-Union guy, being from Ohio, that's kind of what you would expect. And, uh, and he leaves, and, and, uh, but that was another you know, different experience, another way of getting to the Ozarks in those early days. And we have a few examples, uh, like the Buffingtons and the Flanners and the Roundtrees, people who have left us at least a little bit of record that we can tell how they got here, where they came from, what, they were, what their intentions were. And they go to very different places. You know, the Buffingtons... We don't really know why they went to Shannon County. They could have, it would have been much easier in a lot of other places. Maybe it was because that's where they could buy land cheap, where it was still available. And maybe, you know, river bottom or creek bottom land that far off the beaten path in Shannon County was still available in the 1850s, whereas in other more desirable places, all the good land was gone, was long gone by the 1850s. Or you would have had to bought it to to have bought it from somebody else, and paid a lot more than the government was asking for it. So people ended up in the Ozarks from lots of different places and for lots of different reasons. Well, just mention before we get into these these new German immigrants who actually come directly from Europe, and beginning in the 1830s, uh, we'll mention the uh, the Bollinger Colony that. German speakers who had come to the southeastern Ozarks uh, years earlier, but they're not part of the same group. Uh, well, I mentioned them just to remind you that uh, the Germans who start coming to the Missouri River Valley and the Mississippi River Valley in the 1830s and 40s weren't the first German speakers to come to the Ozarks, but they're the ones that we remember now because they come in such large numbers and they maintain their German heritage for generations after they get to Missouri. And this is mainly a Missouri story. There were very few of these Germans who settled anywhere else in the Ozarks. Very few of them ended up in Arkansas. It's mainly in the Missouri Ozarks and, in the, and along the fringes of the Missouri Ozarks, for the most part, where they end up. 
This all goes back to the 1820s when a young German man by the name of Gottfried Duden moves into the Missouri River Valley. He's a, he's a middle class, he's from a middle class German family. He's a Romantic guy. The Romantic movement had a profound impact on uh, many Germans in this era, uh, especially middle class Germans. And he moved into the, what he considered the, the far west of the United States, the, the, the back country, and settled on a farm in the Missouri River Valley. He actually hired a guy to do most of the work for him while he wrote and took walks and, and stuff like that. That was, that was the nice way to do it. The Buffingtons and these other people probably weren't doing it that way. But he spent a couple years in the States. When he went back to Germany in the late 1820s, he wrote, uh, he published his writings that he had done uh, while in America. A lot of these were letters that he had written back to family members bragging about how great America was and how beautiful the Missouri River Valley was and how, uh, how a, you know, a new Germany could be established here west of the Mississippi River. He, gr- he wrote in glowing terms about this place that he had found. Now, he wasn't really in the Ozarks. He was more in the Missouri River Valley. He was on the north side of the Missouri River, in fact, and closer to St. Louis. Uh, but because of his influence, because of the influence of this book that he publishes, a Report of a Journey to the Western States of North America, which comes out in 1829, there's a whole generation of Germans who are influenced to pick up and come to America and to see this land of milk and honey that he has described for them and to start life over. And to many of them were romantic like he was and had ideals of starting this German colony in the New World and maintaining their language and their culture and their customs and all that kind of stuff. And many of them tried to do that for, for at least a few generations. Uh, some of them got here and decided that Duden had been lying through his teeth and life wasn't nearly as rosy or as milk and honeyish as he had described it in that book. But a lot of them liked it and a lot of them stayed. A lot of them got here and didn't have the money to get back, so they were stuck and had to make the best of a bad situation. So you had all, the whole spectrum of experiences for these German immigrants. But many of them made their way to the greater Missouri River Valley area, even to the Mississippi River Valley area. And some of them ended up settling in the geographical Ozarks. Some of them in the hills of the northern part of the Ozarks. Of course, Herman is probably the best known of Missouri's German settlements today. Herman is for Missouri's German heritage like St. Genevieve is to Missouri's French heritage. Herman sort of makes its living off of uh, tourism and, the, and celebrating its German heritage, Oktoberfest and, and all that kind of stuff. And Herman is actually on the Missouri River. It's technically in the geographic Ozarks, though like St. Genevieve, nobody in Herman claims to be in the Ozarks. They're not really in the cultural and historical Ozarks. They're in the geographic Ozarks. But other Germans end up off of the river and farther into the region. Westphalia. Has anybody ever been to Westphalia? If you've ever driven from Rolla to Jeff City on whatever highway that is, you go... Uh, now, the, nowadays, the highway bypasses the old part of Westphalia. There's a little, there's a little new... Uh, kind of bypass there where you don't go. Well, it's a really neat town. It's built up on a ridge. And if you, if you get off and you go through the old business route through town, uh, it's, it's a neat, neat place. Houses right on, the, uh, right on the road. You know, like a lot of German settlements around the Midwest. You know, they're not sitting way off with the big front yards and stuff like uh, most of the English the descendants have. But Westphalia uh, was founded by German Catholics. Uh, I think the town of Westphalia still claims to be the oldest German Catholic town west of the Mississippi River. 
And who are we to argue with them? I, I guess, you know, if they're not, they'd be close to it uh, because it was founded in the 1830s. And you get some of these German settlements in the eastern Ozarks, uh, Dutchtown, just outside of Cape Girardeau, Zell, Missouri, near St. Genevieve. In fact, St. Genevieve County and St. Genevieve becomes heavily German in the years before the Civil War. By the time the Civil War rose around, St. Genevieve is, uh, is one of the most German areas of Missouri. And it's much more German than it is French, really, except for some of the old architecture that was around. But there are a lot more uh, German-born citizens living there. Herman is founded by the German Settlement Society of Philadelphia. Uh, many of these uh, settlers of early Herman had, uh, were recent immigrants who were in Pennsylvania and came over. Others came directly from Germany. Uh, most of these towns were founded by people who came directly from areas, uh, just a variety of areas in Germany. Of course, at that time, uh, this was before German unification, so there were different little kingdoms and municipalities in Germany. There wasn't the one Germany that, that we know, but they came from German-speaking areas. And, but some of them were like the people, uh, a lot of the early Herman settlers, and they had been in the United States for a while, and they were looking for a place where they could kind of carry on German traditions and keep the German language and a lot of these places in the Ozarks, that's what they did for, for generations. Germans survived for a long time. Uh, some of them, some of the early Herman settlers had utopian visions of this kind of new Germany in America. Uh, Herman became known for its, for its uh, vineyards and its wine production. And still today, there are several uh, notable vineyards in, in the Herman area. It's one of the things they're, again, known for today, part of, the thing, part of their tourist trade in that area. As we mentioned, the, the Catholics of Westphalia, and Westphalia spawned several other towns in the northern part of the Ozarks, most of which, again, don't really consider themselves part of the Ozarks. If you remember back... Uh, Last week when we talked about my stop off in Vienna, uh, another one of those old German towns in Vienna, not Ozarks, Iberia, Ozarks. A lot of the Ozarks identity or the failure of these communities to identify with the Ozarks has to do with their German heritage and the fact that they identified the, Ger the Ozarks with English speakers and Anglo-American settlers that they encountered when they first came to Missouri. One of the more interesting of the German settlements was in southeast Missouri in Perry County. And this was a colony of Lutherans who came from the area in Germany known as Saxony. The Lutherans came over in 1839. They were led by a, uh, a Lutheran clergyman by the name of Martin Steppen, and four shiploads left Germany in uh, 1839. By the time they got to New Orleans, and these, grew, these actually did come up the Mississippi River, uh, by the time they got to New Orleans, they had lost one of their ships at sea, but roughly 750 of them made it to America. Most of them settled on farms in the eastern part of Perry County, just a few miles in from the Mississippi River. And they, they established several towns that still exist today, like Frona, uh, Wittenberg, Altenburg. Those are all little, little towns over in the eastern part of Perry County. Another place that doesn't consider itself part of the cultural historical Ozarks, even though it's in the geographer's Ozarks. And it would be uh, this group, some of them also settled in St. Louis, in the St. Louis area. And it would be uh, this group that would help establish uh, in the 1840s what became known as the uh, Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. 
And uh, it's one of the largest Lutheran bodies in America today, the Missouri Synod Lutherans, and one of the, uh, one of the more conservative uh, Lutheran bodies as well, maybe the most conservative uh, of, the, of the primary Lutheran churches in America today. Uh, but uh, Stepan was quickly replaced when they got to America as the leader by another clergyman by the name of Walter, and it was Walter who helped found the Missouri Synod Lutheran Church. Stepan apparently uh, did bad things and was replaced. Apparently was uh, involved with some sort of uh, sexual activities with uh, other colonists and uh, found himself out of a job representing the, the Saxon Lutherans. And, but that's a, uh, today, if you're a Missouri Synod Lutheran, uh, you'll already recognize uh, these places. Frona, uh, the small town of Frona, has, uh, has a little museum, and it's kind, of, it's kind of set up like the, I guess, sort of like the birthplace of the Missouri Synod Lutherans. There's a, there's a, a little history museum there about uh, both this colony and the Missouri Synod Lutherans. And it's, pretty, it's a neat place to visit, beautiful place, over there, really nice farmland, not far from the Mississippi, and uh, it's worth a worth a visit. Just don't try to make them say they're from the Ozarks. And here's a, a map showing us some of these places we've been talking about. Uh, here's uh, Wittenberg and Frona, and uh, I don't guess Altenburg's on there, but you can see over here in Perry County. Uh, here's Dutchtown, we talked about that, in Cape County, uh, Zell up here close to St. Genevieve, and then you've got the, the towns up in the Missouri River Valley. Now there are, uh, we'll talk about these a little bit later in the semester when we talk about the post-Civil War era. Uh, there are a couple of German settlements and other sorts of ethnic settlements in southwest Missouri, but those, are, those tend to be post-Civil War settlements. Once the railroad gets here, and one of the things that railroad companies did was advertised land to immigrants, and every once in a while you would have a, a colony of immigrants who would move in and, and buy land together and kind of set up a little community, and we'll talk about some of those later in the semester uh, like Freistadt, but, uh, but these, the ones that we've been talking about before the Civil War, they were primarily in that sort of arc along the Mississippi and Missouri rivers, and then occasionally a little bit farther down. You can see Westphalia is off of the river, but it's pretty close uh, to the river up there. All right, any questions about our uh, German settlement. There's a book, and, uh, and I've got to get your book review lists posted at some point, but there's a, there's a book called Immigrants in the Ozarks that is largely, it's, it talks about different immigrant groups, but most of it's about the Germans. Anybody who's interested in reading more on that topic. Uh, it's an older book. It was published in the 70s. Uh, by Russell Gerlock, who was a geography professor here at Missouri State back in those days. Uh, but it's, it's uh, got a lot of good information on the background to a lot of those German settlements and, and uh, the, you know, how they spread out and how they found you know, new little colonies from one town to the next. But yeah, Russell Gerlock's Immigrants in the Ozarks.